In this area, I'm starting to look at public health and how architecture can actually contribute to public health. And why can't people laugh when they see the building? So we're starting to build and make these panels that are actually trying to make people smile. We're studying with psychologists, trying to see what, what it's gonna to take to make someone smile when they look at a building in every single time, now that we can make dynamic systems. This program is So the best thing that happened to me is probably the worst thing that happened to my father. I'm the middle of three sisters. He is the father of three daughters. So being the eldest of five boys, the line and the lineage stopped there. Anyway, so what happened to me that was great is the fact that he treated us like boys, that we had no double standard in our family. We had to do everything in the house, including weeding the backyard. We learned to drive the motor home. We drove it across country. We had to do macho type of sports like water skiing. We had to use tools all over our house. So we learned to do a lot of things. And as a result, too, became very ambitious and became very competitive in a world that was usually and typically run by men. So that was great for us girls, and we just moved forward. And without him knowing and thinking that he taught us to be like that, we became very, very successful. So I went to school, I went to Princeton, and I went there thinking that I was gonna be a biology major. I majored in biology because I was good at math and science, like maybe a lot of Koreans. I played cello like a good daughter. I was very obedient. I said that I wanted to go to medical school. Uh, but when I got there, I was exposed to many different things. I was exposed to art, I was exposed to architecture, I was exposed to a lot of different things that really made me very interested. And being at a school like that, we were learning about the Socratic method of learning, which basically was challenging all the different ideas that we learned growing up. So at that point in time, I decided, it's like, maybe I don't want to go to medical school, I'm going to go to architecture school after. Um, but what I did is I started to learn and think about architecture a lot and started to think about how it, it basically is inanimate as materials and didn't move and that we had to live in these boxes. And my question was why when I studied so much biology, it couldn't be more like animals and plants and moving with your body. I thought that architecture should be that third skin, the, the first being the human skin, then clothing, and then finally the architecture around it. Why couldn't it move? So I started studying other things like inanimate objects, and this being the blind person's cane, basically is an extension of the human body. As a person uses it, they can touch things, they can feel the depth, they can feel texture, they can feel all kinds of things with it as if it's part of their body. And that was why I thought, well, architecture can do that too, maybe. So I started looking at other things. You can see here in a more high performance type of situation, the Blade Runner, right, can run actually quite well and fast. So much that the, the other runners that had legs and feet thought it was an unfair advantage. So then here is a material that actually was better, better than biology, which I thought was really quite interesting. Um, and then I started to look at things like this. This is the, the BMW Gina, Gina car. Basically what happens is, as the car goes and speeds across the surface, the body contorts and it actually changes shape. It changes as it's moving. The inside, as you sit down, starts to hug your body and conform to what your body shape is. And again, if a car can do this, why can't architecture? And these are the questions I asked myself. Then I started trying to speculate on what architecture would do. Architecture actually should be different on the outside. Why is it always the same, always static? It should be responding to the different times of day, if it's dark or night or daytime. It should be different temperatures, different wind pressures, all these things, but still our buildings are exactly the same 24 seven. So why? We look at, again, biology. The skin itself can do so many different things. It can be waterproof, it protects you from disease, it can um, sweat when you're too hot, it has goosebumps when you're too cold, all these different things. It's the biggest and first line of defense to the body so the heart and the lungs don't have to work so hard. The same thing happens in buildings. In order for us to save energy, we have to find ways to reduce the burden 
on the mechanical systems, right? The energy used to air condition and heat the building. So I started to look for smart materials. Um, at that time, I left the practice. I was a practicing architect and decided to start looking and doing research for new materials in architecture. Architecture had so few materials out there. They still do have very few materials out there. We still build buildings the same way for the last 100 years. So I started to look at these new materials. This is a thermal bimetal. You can see as it heats up, it curls. As it cools, it flattens again. Basically, it's a lamination of two different metals together. And because they have what's called different coefficients of expansion, when the temperature goes up, one side expands more than the other, and it results in a curl. So I use this material for different things. You can see here, I started to play with the geometries and how we can control this material to open up, to ventilate, to change shape. We use it then to put it on surfaces. This material has never been used for larger surfaces. The surface then, the idea is as it heats up, would start to crimp and curl and allow air to pass through. This is the, the way that it can just automatically ventilate without using any energy, without using any computer controls. So you can see here, it's cold on the left as it heats up and goes towards the right, it starts to open up so air can pass through. This is the first outdoor installation that we made. We use a lot of different computation tools to do so. In doing it, we're connecting it to other different types of modeling and, and computer programs and analysis. You can see here in the red portions, it's an area that the sun actually hits a lot. In the blue areas, it's always in the shade. So by connecting this to different models, we're able to differentiate the surface so that there's parts that are very long and respond to the sun that you can see here. In other areas, you see on the right, they're actually pinned down so that everywhere on this entire thing, is there's no two pieces alike and they do not perform the same. The idea in this case is for both self-shading and for self-ventilating so that the surface can ventilate out the hot air from below and that the area below stays cool. This is really important in places like Los Angeles. Air conditioning is extremely important. In the U.S. alone, it takes up 12% of all energy. This is just air conditioning. Combined with heating, it actually takes up about 40% of all energy used on buildings. Buildings are the biggest culprit of energy use in the world right now more than transportation, more than industry and factories. So here's a product that I actually invented and now is, is market ready. It took quite a while to do this because I'm not trained as a product designer, I'm trained as an architect, but now we have it ready. And you can see what it does. On the left, they flip over, it's inside a double glaze system. And you see on the right, as they flip, the open and closed position is basically the same. You can see through the window the same when it's open and close. It doesn't shut down. It doesn't get dark. It doesn't close down like it does with blinds. Here you see up close the pieces. Again, between two pieces of glass, when the sun hits it, they start to flip over. And they flip over in a way to shade the interior so that the interior stays cool. Okay, this is using, again, no energy, no wiring you can see, no controls. It's just automatic. Um, we have a few installations. This one's in Hawthorne, California. You can see from the inside, from the outside at uh, Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And here you can see on the left, um, them flipping over during the daytime from the outside. And then on the right, you can see it from the inside as they're flipping and shading the interior. So we're able to save probably about 30% on air conditioning because of, of the use of this type of technology. It's simple, it's affordable, and it could be put anywhere. Um, we've gotten a lot of recognition you can see here. It's been great um, and we really appreciate it. But it also leads to other different types of technology. So in this type, it's different. We use a material, the same material except much thicker. This material actually has to heat up in an oven to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we do it, it actually reduces the need for tools in construction and you can do it in different kinds of conditions. So here, you can see just using a glove, it's one person with one hand, right? Because it is hot when it's very curled and as it goes in, it starts to flatten out as it cools and then gets stuck into position. It makes a very, very strong and lightweight system that can be used for different things in architecture. Um, you can see here, um, we had the person on the inside installing the pieces that are in silver. The colored pieces are aluminum. 
right? So that the two used, are used together to make what, what we call a pre-stress system, which is a very, very strong system used in architecture, or oftentimes the bow in a bow and arrow type of situation. You can see on the right, the pieces in aluminum are pretty floppy as they start, but as the pieces go in, it stiffens up really nicely. And so it's a proposal for a type of column, a type of column or ultimately what we demonstrated in a, a tower situation. So you can see that here. Um, we made the bottom portion of a tower. It's actually in the process of being a five-tier system that's supposed to be very, very tall, extremely lightweight, and like I said, very strong. Um, the same thing is used on a sphere. So now we can actually make a surface out of this. And the sphere, you can see in our early study models, went through a lot of different renditions, different scales, different types. This kind of gives you an idea of how we work in many, many different levels. Um, but in this case, we actually made the sphere, um, like many of the things we do, with no uh, fasteners and no tools. Here it is in the South Coast Botanical Garden in its final form. Um, this led to other types of things. If you, the last one was a one hand, one person construction, this is zero person, zero hands. It's just using heat and temperature change to build the thing. It's very, very simple. You can see in this case, it's very small. But what we're doing right now is we're trying to make a flat pack toy vehicle. This is the wheel of a vehicle. The entire thing, we're hoping that we can take it out to the desert, we open it up, we can build itself. The way that we're going to propel this vehicle with the simplest engine is with some of the technology that we have um, brewing for energy generating. This is part of the energy generating technology. You can see in this case, um, this is a typical ventilator you've seen on the roof. The problem is there's a lot of gaps in there that the air and cold air can go down in the wrong time. So the interior gets too cold in the winter time. So we're starting to look at that technology too. So we use it flat when it's cold and when it heats up, these things spin open and then the ventilator can work at hot times. So when it's cold, it goes back to its flat position and controls that cold air from going down deep into the, the space below. So you can start to see them flip back. Um, here's the, the proposal that we're gonna use for the flat pack vehicle that this one-to-one -one, um, energy generating fan or a solar turbine is what we call it, is what's gonna motorize this thing. It's a one-to-one -to, -one to the wheels um, that we can just have exposed to the sun. You can see here the sun is simulated and this thing can actually spin continuously like a, a perpetual motion or momentum wheel. The last part I'm gonna show you is stuff that's a little different. It deviates from the thermal bimetal work but it's trying to use the idea of passive technology. Passive meaning it really requires no energy to operate, it does so automatically. In this area, I'm starting to look at public health and how architecture can actually contribute to public health. The buildings in a downtown area have a lot of surface area. And the question that I ask now is, why is that surface area not being used for public good? Why are we wasting all that surface area just for a building facade. I'm trying to use it right now to reduce smog in urban canyons, an area that there's a lot of smog because, because the canyon's so deep, the smog, which is kind of heavy, just sits there and cannot get out. So how can we use the building facade to basically filter the air? And you can see here, what we're trying to do is run the air across the surface, run them through filters, working with aerospace engineers, people in public policy, um, lung specialist, all these um, these types of experts in big teams to try to resolve this problem in almost any urban city. So you can see here, we're starting to develop some of these tubes on the upper side, the tests that we do and run on the lower. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make these panels for facades so that they can be affordable anywhere in any city around and actually make these bus shelters so that the people who actually wait the longest on the streets and breathe the worst possible air are actually getting the freshest air possible in the city. So that's our goal with this project. Um, the last thing I'm gonna show you too is part of this public health idea, still using those facades, but using it for mental health in this case and trying to improve the mental health of a city. So in my office, we make these little critters too. They're cute, they're funny. Mm -hmm. People smile when they see them. And at first I thought, oh, we just do this for fun. How can this ever be part of architecture? 
But ultimately, my idea now is why can't, why can't a building facade make people smile and why can't people laugh when they see the building? So we're starting to build and make these panels that are actually trying to make people smile. We're studying with psychologists, trying to see what, what it's going to take to make someone smile when they look at a building in every single time, now that we can make dynamic systems. So we're looking at all kinds of ways to do it very simply, to see how people react to these things, and ultimately start to see if it's actually something that smiles at you, because typically when someone smiles at you, you'll smile back. Um, but finding that it's actually less about the smile, less about the gesture, and more about the movement itself. So if it's something as quirky, if it's weird, if it's funky, if it's imperfect, those are the times that people actually smile, which is the opposite of what engineered perfection actually is. So we're looking for imperfection on building facades when we can make them dynamic and ultimately responsive. So in the end, I just want to state too that thank you to my father for having three daughters and you wonder how he feels about it now. I hope he, he likes it pretty well because unfortunately for him, I only have three daughters and he's going to have to like that too. So thank you very much. <laughs> 대한민국 과학기술정보통신부 방송통신발전기금으로 제작되었습니다.